Ladies and gentlemen, pick your dystopia. Are we going to be in a 1984 world where Big Brother is watching your every move and patrolling to make sure that no wrong thing can be heard by anyone? In the last few months, there has been a flurry of loud and angry debates on social media about what can be said and what ideas can be expressed. And what ideas can be expressed. Are we going to be in something more like Brave New World, where people just don't want to engage with certain information? Have you heard of cancel culture, a growing trend on social media where people collectively, collectively decide someone is, quote, canceled based on something negative they did or said? Decide someone is, quote, canceled. Or maybe it's going to be more like Fahrenheit 451, where people are so offended by everything that everything must be banned and we must burn books. So in case you haven't heard, Amazon, one of the most powerful monopolies in the world, as a matter of fact, one of the most powerful companies in the world, has been effectively burning books. Has been effectively burning books. Well, I think it's a little bit of all of them. I think this is a really important point that needs to be made. Because what we're seeing right now isn't just mass censorship. In 2018, there was a new push and tech companies began really focusing on what they call quote unquote social responsibility. Now, companies are really starting to take that bigger look at how they're changing their industry, how they're embedding themselves into people's lives, and more and more they're starting to talk about what are their real responsibility to society as a whole. First, let's hear what Bill Gates has to say. My assumption, you know, going into the digital era was that the more people who could publish and the fact you could have reputation systems about was reliable would mean that we'd have more voices out there and we would become more knowledgeable and society would benefit from that depth of understanding. What we're seeing now, which is an offset to that benefit, of people clustering in communities where they're listening to things that are attacks on the people they don't like, even if they're true or not. I hope that you know, people's desire is to know the truth and to share ideas with other people. But it, it certainly is being questioned mm -hmm. whether it's, it's working that way or not. And a lot of debate about, well then, what's the responsibility of the network to expose people to different points of view or filter out things that are wrong? And it's a tough thing to be put in that, that position. You know, what is, what is so anti-scientific that it shouldn't be out there? So the digital era, you know, it's new and, and it's, it is a bit concerning. Uh, so you hear him talking about how people are clustering into online communities based on what they're interested in, which is, I don't know why they didn't think that was what was going to happen. I mean, it only makes logical sense to me. But then he says, and I think this is really key, there's a lot of debate about what the responsibility is of the network to expose people to other points of view. So right now we're seeing this huge censorship push. And I mean, they're, they're trying to stop people from criticizing governments to not be able to question major breaking news events, to telling people that the science is just settled and there's no debate on specific scientific topics. And essentially that history is written by the victors and we can't question historical events. A leaked Google a briefing earlier this week revealed how the internet giant and others like Facebook and Twitter are increasingly policing which content stays online and which doesn't. More than 800 pages banned by Facebook and these are not some fringe accounts, conspiracy peddlers or extremists. Some of the pages have been around for years and have millions of followers. This is censorship. Uh, the online world is the new public sphere and it's wrong that major corporations like Facebook, like Instagram, have the power to remove opinions from public consideration. There is a dangerous precedent being set here where the big tech companies have appointed themselves as the gatekeepers of political thought and opinion. So, really dangerous. Okay, to not just freedom of speech, but freedom of thought. Right now, it looks like anyone talking about this 11-year-old drag kid, which, by the way, we can't talk about, because anyone right now talking about this individual in a critical context or even a reporting context that this individual or their families does not like, automatically, the videos on YouTube are being disappeared 
and of course hit with fake copyright strikes. Books are being digitally burned. A lot of people are saying, it's Amazon's a private company, they can ban whatever books they want. Do we want to live in a world where companies which control the majority of book sales and ebook sales for the most part can ban books? You have anything deemed quote unquote an authoritative source, which we know who's making those decisions. The authoritative sources are all being promoted while small independent thinkers are getting demonetized, demoted, banned, and algorithms are being changed to bury their information. They're just like, oh, it's propaganda. Well, you know what, guess what? It's only propaganda if one side of the story is being told. See, here's what's going on in the broadest stroke of things, is the internet made possible, you know, what they always call a democratization of views or, or voices. And now people have begun to talk and there's a complete diversity of viewpoints. There's people from every conceivable viewpoint and they have spoken on the internet and everyone who wants a channel has set one up and there are blogs all across the web and they have totally owned and discredited the mainstream media, pointed out all their many fallacies and lies and shortcomings and people have made known how unhappy they are with the status quo and the system that's going on and they have become vocally outspoken online and the system hates it and they're trying to reclaim the territory, they're trying to sanitize it and they're trying to reclaim the narrative for their corporate partners. We're gonna to have to rebuild within this wild, wild west of information flow some sort of curating function that people agree to. But it's one step farther to come out and claim that these networks have a responsibility to expose people to other points of view, or essentially what is the official accepted point of view. That's a whole new level than just censoring. Aaron brought this up in the last video too, and I wanna dive into this just a little bit deeper to show you what, essentially what Bill Gates is talking about. YouTube, which is owned by Google, which is a parent company called Alphabet, Think about that every time I do one of these videos. They put out this document in February, so just last month, called How Google Fights Disinformation. And they specifically mention that disinformation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So right away, not everyone is gonna even agree on what that means. But they go on to say it's to purposefully disseminate information that you know to be inaccurate with the hope that others believe it's true or to create discord in society. Well, because what's accurate, according to Google, are sources like Wikipedia and authoritative sources such as mainstream media outlets. And this has been pointed out. It's a really good point that there's no way for these companies to make algorithms that are sophisticated enough to be able to tell the difference between quote unquote blatantly false misleading information and a conspiracy theory that might turn out to be totally true. There are lots of examples, and this guy makes the point that this would be the same as if you had, back during the Watergate days, prior to that coming out, if all the newspapers got together and said, we're banning all stories on this topic. We're just not even gonna allow anyone to talk about it at all. Even though that's totally something that turned out to be true, there's lots of things that turn out to be true. There's no possible way with how many posts are being made to these social media outlets in just the span of a single minute, you're talking about millions of posts. There's no way for them to do that in a way that they can do that with human beings. That is something that only computer algorithms are handling. And so they're just blanket banning things because there's no way to do this any other way. And there's no way for them to make a sophisticated enough algorithm that can really truly tell the difference. This is just a way to blanket ban things and take them out of public discussion, out of public debate, out of public view, and out of public thought. Google and YouTube admit that they're not just following their own community guidelines. Sure, they set up rules and they said everyone has to follow the rules and they could ban you if you break the rules, but they admit what they're doing right now and Facebook and other social media platforms are doing it too, is they're targeting content that admittedly doesn't break community guidelines, but it comes close to it. It's approaching the boundaries, right? In other words, stuff that doesn't break the rules, they're now targeting. And in this document, How Google Fights Disinformation, 
they admit straightforwardly that after the community guidelines, they have a secondary set of rules that are internal, that are not disclosed to the public, and which they use to basically demote content, censor and remove content, and uh, bury it inside their algorithm. So they claim they're gonna keep content on the platform unless it violates their community guidelines, but they say right here, YouTube maintains a more detailed and living set, in other words, constantly changing, set of enforcement guidelines that provide internal guidance on the enforcement of public community guidelines. These are extensive and dynamic to assure that policies apply to changing trends and new patterns of controversial content online. Well, controversy is synonymous with having a point of view with dissenting against whatever might be dominant at the time. It's just part of any democratic society, any society with free speech and, and the right to free views at all. But they admit that they have internal guidelines to help them rein in uh, you know, controversial content and that these are evolving and that, quote, YouTube does not typically disclose these updates to the public because doing so would make it easier for unscrupulous users to evade detection. So in other words, everyone else has no idea what could get them banned or demoted tomorrow.